Good morning. Welcome back. We're, uh, we're in week six, final week of our series called Remnant, which is about the vision of Lake Springs Church. And so uh, if you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, a lot to, uh, lot to catch you up on. But ultimately, we, uh, we titled this series Remnant because uh, a remnant is a group of people who stay resilient um, in the face of cultures of compromise uh, in scripture, whether religious or secular. And, uh, and the, the, mis- or the vision statement that we have as a church is to be a holy people in Holly Springs, that we would be this remnant group of people that are resilient in the midst of cultures of compromise. Um, no matter what comes our way, that we'll stay faithful to the way of Jesus. And so we, we, uh, we have this vision, but we also have a way in which we feel like God is going to lead us into that. And it's by doing and focusing on things like formation and hospitality, and family, and missions around the corner and around the world. And today we're going to talk about our vision for leadership. Here's the vision statement that we have for leadership um, at our church. It's to see God bring great kingdom leaders to train, serve, and be sent out. Uh, that's the vision that we have for leadership. But in order to kind of break this down, is what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to break down this statement um, a little bit at a time. So uh, one thing that is for certain in all of these statements, and which may be obvious to some of you, but it's that God is doing the work. And we, we anticipate and believe that God is the one that does the work. We are committed to doing our part, what he's called us into. But ultimately, we cannot do this without him and his presence, which was kind of what I talked about in week one. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of the beginning of this statement as well, that we believe uh, we want to see God do this in our church. And we're praying that God would do this in our church, uh, bring great kingdom leaders. But when you say the things like great kingdom leaders, that's some, somewhat ambiguous, right? Like you may not know exactly, well, what does that actually mean? Or, or what does that actually look like? Or what do we gauge that by? Or how do we gauge that? And so um, let, me, let me explain great kingdom leadership. Because it's a really important question that we have to ask. If we're going to actually gauge, is God actually doing this? Is he bringing this? Is he establishing this in our church or not? Um, and so, so let me explain kind of what we're looking at when we're looking at kingdom leaders. For the most part, um, or, or maybe first and foremost, above all other things, we're looking for people who are full of the spirit and who are wise. Or at least desiring to grow deep in wisdom. And I'll explain why the desire actually matters as we go on. But, but let me explain. We get this guidance in Acts chapter 6. The church is having some issues uh, with disputes uh, because certain people are being discriminated against because of their ethnicity. Um, and so the church, or the elders of the church, look at the church, the body, and say, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. This is the qualification for leadership, according to the elders of the early church, that you would find people who can serve and lead in the church who have this are full of the spirit and wisdom. This this verse is a guide to the two primary requirements, I think, for leadership in the church above all else, that leaders in the church must be people who are full of the spirit, who have wisdom or are, are seeking after and desire to gain wisdom. But what does it look like first to be full of the Spirit? Well, to talk about this, I want to go to Matthew chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to talk about what, what it looks like to be full of Spirit. We're going to use Jesus as an example um, because I believe that there is no better example of someone who is full of the Spirit than Jesus after he's been fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights. So this is what it says in Matthew chapter 1, or Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, sorry. It says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I'm so glad that Matthew told us that. He, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is not, it is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, he said, then throw yourself down for it is written. He will command angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against 
a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said. If you will bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. There's a lot to unpack in these few verses, but let me first just start with this. You know Jesus is full of the Spirit because he's being led by the Spirit. It says that in verse 1. It says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. He didn't just wander into the wilderness. Okay? The Spirit led him into the wilderness. And where the Spirit is leading him is actually into a place of spiritual warfare. He's leading him into a place where the Bible actually says he's being led to be tempted by the devil. And so if you are actually walking with the Spirit and you actually have the Spirit, sometimes the Spirit will lead you into places of difficulty. Lead you into places that are, that are, that are not always the easiest places to go. But because the Spirit is the Spirit, <laughs> you can rely on Him as Jesus does. The second thing that's mentioned that I think is really important is that Jesus has been fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and what we talk about when we talk about fasting, I'll remind you guys of a little bit of something that we talked about last summer and, and we, in our practice of fasting even, was that we are, he, he, what he's doing is he's denying his flesh. He's denying his fleshly desire. And instead, he is feeding on the Spirit. So although he's at his most vulnerable place in his flesh, he's at his height spiritually. He is as strong as he's ever been spiritually, even though his flesh is weak. When he's tempted to turn stones into bread, it would have easily been something that would have nourished him and, and dealt with the hunger pains that he had. But he wasn't interested in just dealing with the hunger pains. He was interested in abiding and walking in the spirit. And so he quotes scripture back to the devil. And then, which is the third thing that I think is like really noticeable about Jesus being full of the spirit, and uh, it is that Jesus knows the scriptures the word of God is in him. And so the spirit of God is in him through the word of God. And he is living by that word. He does not feast on the words of other men. He feasts on every word that comes from the mouth of God and God alone. God's word uh, keeps him strong and able to fight off temptation. He's not going to the New York Times bestseller list to get advice. He goes to the word of God and he lets it fill his heart and his soul to a place of real strength in the midst of difficulty and struggle. So those are a few things that point to Jesus' spirit filledness, if that's a word, I don't know. Um, but, but, here's, but here's something else that I think is really interesting is that there's a pattern to these temptations. There's a pattern to the temptations that I think are, are temptations for every leader that I've ever met in the church. And definitely reign true for me if maybe you've led in a church and this isn't a temptation for you. But this definitely reigned true in my life as a leader in the church. And the temptations are this, to be relevant, to be spectacular, and to be powerful. To be relevant, to be spectacular, and to be powerful Jesus is first tempted to be relevant. He is tempted to do something that would prove his relevant position as God's son. Which is interesting because you'll notice the language that the, the devil uses here is he says, if you are the son of God. Now Jesus has just walked away from his baptism. <laughs> He's just been baptized where, where God came out of heaven and said, this is my son and whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. So he's just heard this from the mouth of God. And so the devil comes to him and what does he attack? He attacks his identity. He attacks if he's actually relevant to the, to the future of humanity as God has declared him to be. And are you actually a relevant person? Prove it. Prove your relevance. And this is why Jesus quotes back to him the scripture that he does. He says, I don't, I don't, no, no, I don't, I don't feed on bread alone. I feed on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What does God say to me? What does God say about me? Who does God call me? He calls me his son. And so this 
this aspect is, is Jesus. He's feasting on, on the Spirit of God and God's words, and he's choosing to remain irrelevant. This is what Henry Nouwen says. He says, I'm deeply convinced that the Christian leader of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or her vulnerable self. That is the way Jesus came to reveal God's love. The great message that we carry as ministers of God's word and followers of Jesus is that God loves us not because of what we do or accomplish, but because God has created and redeemed us in love. And he has chosen to proclaim that love as the true source of all human life. So it's not about trying to become relevant but it's about becoming irrelevant, knowing that God's love is the source of all life. So to be, to be a spirit-filled leader, or to be a great kingdom leader that is spirit-filled, you must feast on the spirit as opposed to a desire for relevance. And allow God to use whatever irrelevant position that you have for his glory. The second temptation that Jesus faces is the temptation to be spectacular. He's tempted to defy death, right? Uh, Satan calls and says, hey, why don't you jump off of the temple and then call the angels down to swoop you up, right? It's like some sort of beautiful magic trick that the devil's trying to tempt him into. And, and which I, I'm, I assure you, if we were all standing there and that happened, we would all applaud, right? We'd be like, wow. That was incredible. That was impressive. It's like an illusion, right? You guys ever seen an illusionist? Like, they're pretty incredible things. Like, I don't know how they get the table to float. Like, I don't know how they do that, right? But like, so, so there's this idea of like, hey, why don't you do a magic trick, Jesus? Be spectacular. Like, do something for the applause of men. And oftentimes, can I just be honest? Like, we're commissioned we're commissioned to do things as, as leaders in the church that ultimately will receive the applause of men. And it's kind of scary. When I think about what I learned in Bible college, I was taught to write sermons, and I was taught how to read Greek and Hebrew, and I was taught how to understand context and be creative. I was taught how to lead a church and lead a staff. I was taught how to baptize people and how to counsel people with problems. Ultimately, when I was done, I, I was given training uh, uh, that, that basically allowed me to walk up a mountain with a backpack full of things that would help wanderers along the way. And I was taught, based off of that, that people need me. I was taught that without me, people are doomed. I was taught... That without being spectacular, the kingdom has no chance. And it is a constant struggle and it is a constant challenge to always remember that people don't need more of me. They need more of Jesus. They don't need me. They need Jesus. And honestly, it's hard sometimes to stand up here and remember why I do what I do and even do it for the right reasons. It's hard not to let... Uh, sermons that fall flat and, and seemingly leave your lives unchanged bother me. But one of the biggest issues in the American church culture that we have to fight against is the ability to draw and the desire to draw thousands of people to a venue without the Spirit. Because that, I mean, that's legitimately happening all the time. You don't need the Spirit of God to be spectacular. You just have to be charismatic and have some sort of vision, have some sort of skill set or gifting. You need the Spirit of God actually to actually become less. You don't need the Spirit of God to become more. That's why John the Baptist, he says of Jesus, he says, I must become less so he could become more. And Jesus has to become more and I have to become less because it's about him. And the heart and the mark of a spirit filled leader is one 
who does the hard work of becoming less so Jesus can become more. He doesn't give in to the temptation of being spectacular. But lastly, Jesus is tempted to be powerful. He's, he's tempted by Satan to take control and have power over all the kingdoms of the world, right? I'm going to lead him up onto a mountain and show him everything that could be his. Take it now. Take it now. Henry Nouwen also says this. Power offers an easy substitute for the hand or the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people and easier to own life than love life. Leaders who are full of the Spirit do not cover power, but they live out of this hard task of loving God and loving others. First and foremost. But we're given a lot. We're given a lot to handle. We're given a lot to control. We're given a lot to lead. And so it's oftentimes hard to do that with love. It's hard oftentimes to not let those things that you're given to become the ultimate things instead of people. This has been a, a constant um, work that I've been trying to go through over the last year, almost more than anything else in ministry and leadership over the last year. One of the things that I've been trying to do over and over and over again is to put love ahead of everything else. And it is so, so very hard. I'm trying so hard to remember that the great commandment to love God and love others comes before the great commission. And it comes before living out and even growing this church. Because without love, there is nothing. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. And it is so, so very difficult. But we have to understand and leaders have to understand in the church that loving God and loving others that are entrusted in our care is first and above anything else when striving to build a church. That you won't build a church on Jesus Christ if you do it without love. You might build a church with lots of people. But you won't build a church on Jesus Christ without love. You know, Jesus had a chance right there. In this third temptation to take all that he wanted. All the kingdoms of the world. To control it. To make it his, to make it obedient to his beck and call. But instead, the way he chooses to take hold of the kingdom and take hold of the world and bring heaven to earth is by dying. By becoming nothing, becoming a servant, and by loving us till the very end, dying for our sins. And so this kind of sacrificial love is a mark of a truly spirit-filled leader. These are the kinds of spirit-filled leaders that we are praying for and that we are looking for. Ones that reject these temptations to be relevant, spectacular, and powerful. But the second thing that makes great kingdom leaders, as I said earlier, is wisdom. The Bible consistently speaks of the importance of wisdom and the use of it to consistently describe great leaders who are respected throughout the scriptures. But there are two ways in order to get wisdom. Two ways to get wisdom. Wisdom is given by God to those who desire it and those who earn it. Those who desire it and those who earn it. Let me explain what I mean by that. In James chapter 1, verse 5, James says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now think about what that says. If you ask God for wisdom, he gives it to all who ask for it without finding fault. It doesn't matter how ignorant you are. <laughs> How young you are, how old you are, it does not, that, that is not the important factor in God's mind. It's your desire. It's the desire of your heart to have wisdom. He'll give it if you desire it. This is, this is so, so powerful. Here's also something that as I was reading through 1 Kings recently, it just jumped off the page. Maybe more than any verse that I've read in a really long time. 
You know, I don't, I don't typically like to pull verses out of, you know, left field. But, but ultimately, like I was reading this, and when I read it, I was just taken aback. And I was thinking to myself, man, this has to become, this has to become my prayer. I have to make this my prayer. This has to become a new prayer for me, that, that a new way of at least praying something that I feel in my heart needs to be said. And this is what Solomon says in 1 Kings 3, verse 9. Here is what I want. Give me a God-listening heart so I can lead your people well, discerning the difference between good and evil, for who on their own is capable of leading your glorious people? The idea of having a God listening heart, that God would speak and we would hear his words, that we might be able to lead people well, discerning good from evil, right from wrong. We need God to speak to us. We need, or we need God to speak to us for um, this to, to happen, for us to lead well. And we need to be listening to when he speaks. But if you're a leader or you want to be a leader or you're thinking maybe one day I could be a leader, then then I don't know a better prayer in the Bible that you could pray as a leader. Because this this is how God responds to, to Solomon. He says, says, God, the master was delighted with Solomon's response. And God said to him, because you have asked for this and haven't grasped after a long life or riches or doom for your enemies, but you have asked for the ability to lead and govern well, I will give you what you ask for. I'm giving you a wise and mature heart. There's never been one like you before, and there'll never be one after. As a bonus, I'm giving you both the wealth and the glory you didn't ask for. There's not a king anywhere who will come up to your mark. And if you stay on course, keeping your eye on the life map and the God signs as your father David did, I'll also give you a long life. It's such an amazing way in which God welcomes and honors those who desire wisdom and desire to lead his people well. God honors that heart. He honors leaders like that. And so wisdom, God gives wisdom to those who desire it and who have a desire for it and have a hunger for it and want to learn and and are humble enough to know that they don't know everything. God consistently uses leaders like that in the Bible. And we hope he uses leaders like that at our church. But also wisdom is earned. And by that... I mean, there's no substitute for gray hair, okay? Uh, like, there's just not. Like, it's just, there's some, there is, a, there is a amount of wisdom that comes with age that is abundantly valuable in the kingdom and abundantly valuable in the church that we have to tap into and take hold of. And the truth is, there, there are some of, there, there, there's, there, there, we have young people here we have people who are n- not young and have gray hair. And, and man, I, speaking as probably one of the younger, like we need you people with gray hair to share, to share your wisdom. People, people ask me all the time or they, they say like, oh man, I'm really starting to turn gray. And I'm like, man, give me some of that. I'm not kidding. I want as much of it as I can get. Because Proverbs, Proverbs says that it is the splendor of the old. The splendor of the old is their gray hair. Meaning that like there's wisdom that comes with that. There's something valuable about that. And there, there's something about youth that you're strong and able. There's something about wisdom that comes with gray hair. And so when people are like, man, I'm just, I can't, I'm just getting gray. I'm like, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Because there's something that you're learning that I don't know yet. And I'd love to learn it from you. And so you may not, you may not be called to stand up here and preach sermons. But you know, in, in the book of Titus, it talks about older members of the church bestowing wisdom to younger members of the church. And if you're somebody who you've lived a few more years than some of the rest of us, please, 
Don't shy away from the leadership that God's called you into to help walk alongside of those like me who need your wisdom, who need to learn from you and grow. You know, there's... Uh, <laughs> Mallory and I had dinner with a family at church not too long ago. We got invited over to their house and we went over to their house and uh, they, they, did a, they did a Google stock on us, uh, which means that they stalked us by using a Google search. Uh, and, uh, and so they found out, they drummed up this old video of Mallory and I when we were starting to plant churches in 2011. We were 23 years old and, uh, and, um, and it, they, they just thought it was, it was so cute. They're like, you guys were just babes, you know, you're just so young and and Mallory and I were in our room the other night, and we were just hanging out and chatting, and we were like, we should look up that video, see where they found that. So we did the Google search, too, and we found the video they were talking about, and we turned it on. We turned it off in, like, 15 seconds. <laughs> and it's like, we got, like, 15 seconds in, and we were just, I, I was like, turn it off. Turn it off right now. <laughs> because to be honest with you, like, I just, my youthful ignorance and pride made me sick. It just made me so sick. I'm serious. I'm 35, so I'm not super old now, but I'm probably going to watch this sermon when I'm 47 and do the same thing, you know? But, but seriously, I mean, I feel like I'm a different person than I was 12 years ago. And it's mostly due to the wisdom that I've gained just over living those years as a husband and as a father and learning how to live life and have a marriage and raise kids and spend money and a lot of the things that, just to be honest, 12 years ago, I was ignorant to. And we need to take a look back from time to time just to see the wisdom that God has given us. We need to take a look back sometimes to know, like, have we changed? Am I a different person this year than I was last year? Am I a different person this year than I was three years ago or five years ago? Because if you are, then that's probably some wisdom that God has given you. And if not, then maybe you're not asking for wisdom enough. The reality is, is that we need wisdom. And as we've gained wisdom, as we see ourselves gain wisdom, it should inspire us and give us a desire for more and ask God for more. Because he'll give it. He'll give it. So our, our hope and our vision and our belief is if we can find great kingdom leaders who are both full of the spirit and wise or at least seeking after wisdom. They desire that. Then we believe we can train them. We can give them opportunities to serve. We can trust them to lead well. And we can also... When God calls them to places that aren't here, we can send them out to continue to make impact for the kingdom. We believe that this is a part of it. And I know maybe some of you right now, you're like, oh, well, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great, Derek. So glad that you shared your vision for leadership with all of us here who don't care about being a leader in the church. <laughs> but... You're, you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not called to be a preacher. I'm not called to be a youth minister or a children's minister or, or a worship leader or an elder. I'm not called to church leadership. So why are you even sharing this vision with me? Well, one is, if you are somebody who is full of the Spirit and desires wisdom and will gain that wisdom... It would do the church good if you would step up and lead. It would bless us so greatly if you would step up and lead. In whatever way you feel like God is calling you to. If you're somebody who's full of the Spirit, you'll know what that is. You have something to offer that the church needs. But here's the other thing. If not that, and I wouldn't close the door on that too quickly, but if it's not that, 
this can and should be a legitimate point of prayer for you in our congregation. We need your prayers. Those of us that are leading right now, we need it so bad. We cannot do this without the Spirit. We cannot do this without the presence of God. We cannot lead well without His provision and His guidance. And so we need your prayer as we lead and as we call more leaders. Right now we're in the process of trying to find two elders. We don't know who those two people are going to be. We know that two of our elders are going to take a year-long sabbatical at the end of this year, starting in 2024. We want to bring on two new elders to lead at our church. We need your prayers that we find the right, spirit-filled, wise men to sit in those seats. We're in the process of trying to hire new staff. And we need your prayers as we interview and as we put out, uh, like, seeking applications and as we accept resumes and as we pray over resumes and as we look at things and we're trying to fill gaps in our church what are the most important gaps that we need to fill all of those kinds of things what's the best use of the the church's finances and resources when it comes to stuff we need your prayer for all of that and without it we don't have a whole lot of hope (laughs) but we also need your prayer those of us that are serving You know, I can speak for Mallory and I, and I know David and Vasti well enough to know that every day we walk into this building, we got a target on our back. And I'm not saying that because I want your pity, but I do want your prayers. Because we put the target on our back. And we like it there. Because we love what we do. But it doesn't mean it's easy. (laughs) And it takes a toll on our marriages and on our children, on our families, on our hearts and our souls all the time. And so we need your prayers to stay faithful, to stay committed. Do you know that the average... The average person who gets into ministry after Bible college or seminary lasts less than three years. Because it's hard. (laughs) They burn out. They struggle. Their souls are empty. Because all they do is pour out. And after two and a half years of that, everybody's ready to quit. Do you know that our Bible colleges are producing about 50% less leaders for ministry than they did 10 years ago? Our Bible colleges and our seminaries are dying. We aren't producing more leaders through colleges and universities. And so a place where we have to pray that God will produce leaders for the church is in the church. We need to be praying for people that we have sent out, like Garrett. We love that guy. I don't know if you guys know him, but if you do know him, you love him. And you know, a few months ago, he was called and led to another church in Winston-Salem. And he's doing great. I'm so excited to get to see him tomorrow and spend a day with him. And he's doing a really good job, but it's hard work. He had to pick up his family and move to another city, make new friends, lead a church where he doesn't know a soul. He needs our prayers. So when you say, well, what does what is, what is the vision for leadership mean? Or why does it matter to me? It matters a lot. At least it should. Because we won't have workers for the harvest if you're not diligently praying for the leaders and for more leaders. 
You know, Jesus, he says that the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. So pray that the Lord of the harvest will send workers into the field. We need those prayers. We need those prayers because we need workers. And we need prayers that God will raise up men and women in our churches and in this church who are both full of the Spirit and wise to be those workers in the harvest themselves. Let's pray. God, thank you for... Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your... unrelenting desire to show us your love that it would lead you to the cross to being obedient to death when you could have had everything without having to go through the cross when you could have had everything without having to deal with the struggle It was your love that held you on the cross for our sin that we might find freedom and hope. That we might be able to know that our relevance isn't determined by what we accomplish or what we can do or what other people call us, but it is what you call us, that we are your sons and your daughters by your grace and your love. God, that we don't have to be spectacular, but we can just be ordinary, unschooled men, and you'll turn us into world changers, like your disciples. God, that we don't have to seek after power, because the most powerful thing we can do is choose to love someone who doesn't deserve to be loved. That's what you've shown us. And so God, may we desire to be more like you in all of these ways. To be full of the Spirit and to be wise. God, give us a God-listening heart that we might be able to discern good from evil. For we cannot lead your people without you in your presence. God, we love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.